you. You may be seated. And that is a good introduction for the message tonight. Uh, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. We begin a new chapter, a chapter that deals with the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 13, tonight we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. You recall how our text ended last week as we moved to the end of chapter 12. The word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname is Mark. A very interesting transition that brings us from the death of Herod into the first missionary journey. We contrasted Herod being eaten by worms and dying, set in immediate contrast, but the word of God grew and multiplied. A very uh, interesting contrast indeed, and we learned four lessons from that. Number one, men are temporal, but the word of God is eternal. Number two, men shrink from the scene and most are forgotten, but God's word expands and is never forgotten. Third, the glory of man is passing, but the word of God is permanent. And finally, faith in human leadership is futile, but faith in the scripture lasts and spreads. And we did a study on that word grew and saw that the idea of growth, which comes from the plant kingdom, is used in the New Testament of spiritual growth, not merely of numerical growth. We saw passages dealing with that in Ephesians, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and so on, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. We saw that times of trouble are often times of numerical growth in the church, and that was what took place in the early chapters of the book of Acts. And we saw that times of peace are often times of spiritual growth in the church. We traced that word multiplied through the book of Acts and saw that most of the early church growth passages in the book of Acts dealt with the Lord adding to the church. And we saw that when the word of God mentions multiplication, sometimes it is in the context of problems, such as in Hebrews, excuse me, Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. We saw that Satan hates the multiplication of God's people and the multiplication of God's word and always tries to stamp it out. But the usual emphasis on multiplication was spreading to new directions and to different groups of people. And we saw that in Acts 6 and also in Acts 9, which preceded the passage that we were looking at. We compared it with God being a God who loves to multiply and cause life versus Satan who loves to kill and cause death. And all the way back to the book of Genesis, we see the abundant, amazing grace of God in multiplication of human life and animal life and bird life and fish life. And uh, if you've ever been to the ocean and uh, seen the schools of fish that are there or into a lake where you see huge schools of fish, you realize God is a God who loves life. Those of you who have had to rake leaves recently know that God multiplies. <laughs> Lots of leaves on the trees. And every year, more and more and more and more. God is a God of life. And we noticed the striking fact of how many times in Scripture, and we came all the way through the Old Testament looking at these passages, how many times that command, I will multiply thee, or the statement concerning, I will multiply thee, contained conditional clauses related to obedience. And you got to learn a child song last week that we taught our children on that. God is the God of life, both physical and spiritual. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Not merely increase you monetarily, but the fruits of righteousness. So God does not forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name and that you do minister to the saints and are ministering and that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and, prom and patience inherit the promises. And then he gives the illustration of Abraham talking about our faithful obedience and the spiritual fruit, he compares it to the faithfulness of Abraham. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless thee and multiplying 
I will multiply thee. We saw that whenever God sends out a team, there's a weak link. The one in this case is John Mark. We saw Paul's warning to Timothy when he gives the qualifications for a man who would be a bishop, that is, one who would be an elder. And one of those qualifications in verses 6 and 7, which is where we were going to pick up tonight, is not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. Because we're looking at, in chapter 13, at the very beginning of this missionary journey, a major confrontation with the devil. And there were three warnings that are given to us in that passage about a young man who is a novice. We don't know for sure, but perhaps as Paul wrote to Timothy, he had that incident with John Mark in mind. Timothy was a young man, but Timothy was also a seasoned man. Just like Titus was a young man, but he was a seasoned man. Both of them had been through some major spiritual warf warfare by the time the Apostle Paul wrote First and Second Timothy, Second Timothy being the last epistle that he wrote, and the book of Titus. So we saw what's going on here. Revival has swept Jerusalem through the proclamation of the word of God. Saul and Barnabas leave Jerusalem, go back to Antioch. They take John Mark with them, perhaps recommended by Peter, and eager for his first short-term sum team that was actually going to be a major battle. That brings us to chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Interesting, God reached into the royal family and he saved somebody who had actually been a playmate of Herod's. Interesting, isn't it? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Gracious Father, as we look into the word tonight, we pray that you will give guidance and direction that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified and that we would understand the spiritual conflict in which not only we are involved, but all those who have gone forth from this place to be missionaries, to serve Christ on the foreign field, to serve in areas where the name of Christ has never been named, and some to serve where Christ has indeed been presented and named, but where Satan has taken root and raised great opposition. We pray for our missionaries, Father, for they will face many of the same things that are faced in this chapter. We also pray, Father, that you will raise up men who are seasoned, trained well, articulate in their faith, and capable of standing firm in the armor of the Lord against the wiles of the devil. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of darkness. And so, Father, we pray that you'll make us alert to that fact and not merely think that things are a problem or that it's just human carnality, though there is much of that, when we are doing spiritual battle. Our enemy is real. Our enemy is deadly. Our enemy has caused many young Christians to flee and fall in the past. So, Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you noticed a very striking contrast as I read through those first five verses here in chapter 13 tonight. 
The first thing that we notice is the contrast between verse 2 and verse 5. Verse 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. There are only two people mentioned in verse 2. But in verse 5 it says, And when they, that is Barnabas and Saul, were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. The Holy Spirit specifically called and commissioned Barnabas and Saul in verse 2. John Mark went with them without the specific direction of the Holy Spirit in verse 5. I think it is always a dangerous thing to enter into ministry without the specific, clear call of God. Some people make light of that. Some people think, well, I think I would like to do that. Some people have an odd idea that ministry is an easy task, that it is something that Hey, is certainly an occupation where I can do nice things. And they have no idea of the danger of ministry. This past week I read a very interesting article that came to me about the, um, the pressures of ministry. And one of the polls that was cited in that particular article said that about 90% of those involved in full-time ministry stated that there had been some danger or damage to their families while they were serving in ministry. As a direct result of serving in ministry. It also mentioned that about 50% of them said that Ministry was downright hazardous to their family life. That's not the normal response for people who are involved in other occupations. Yes, there are other occupations where perhaps the breadwinner of the family is so deeply involved in the occupation that it damages his family. But these were men of God who were seeking to do the will of God, seeking to follow scriptural advice, that is, commands, concerning the raising of family, and they discovered that it was a hazardous thing to do to be involved in ministry. And that's why I say it is always a dangerous thing to enter into ministry without a specific and clear call of God. I look back to my college days and all the young people there at this Christian college that wanted to be involved in some kind of a ministry. I look back to my days in seminary, an excellent seminary with excellent training that accepted only men who had high academic qualifications and whom the faculty and admissions committee was convinced were men who would be qualified for ministry. I think about one-third of my class, and that's a high percentage, failed in ministry. Ministry is dangerous to your spiritual life unless you have been called and sent by the Holy Ghost. Do you remember what we mentioned just a moment ago, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7? There were three warnings related to warfare with the devil for the man of God. Here is Timothy, a young pastor evangelist, to whom the Apostle Paul is writing giving him warnings about ministry. The three warnings, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach 
and the snare of the devil. The condemnation of the devil, the reproach of the devil, the snare of the devil. The condemnation of the devil, the text explains it to us specifically, it tells us the reason that the devil was condemned was pride. Being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. That is the reason that God hates the sin of pride above almost all other sins. Because it seeks to replace God and put self on the throne. We know this from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart. And here are five gigantic I wills. The setting of self above God. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. Got three, two and three out of order, or three and four out of order there, but those are the five great I wills of Satan. Verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. You know, it's rather interesting because as we look at this passage, you heard me read it last week. But in a different context, that was one of the passages that we looked at when we looked at the worms that ate Herod in the preceding verses. It describes Satan and the other rebels against God as covered with worms and lying in a bed of worms in hell. And so we have Paul speaking here of the condemnation of the devil. You see, when you put a novice in a position of honor, authority, or leadership, you are not doing him any favors. You're merely giving him a fat head and puffing him up, and worst of all, you are setting him up for judgment by God. Not a novice. When you're choosing leadership in the church, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. He begins to think that he's important because he did not have to earn his wings. You've heard that phrase, earn his wings. In a church that I pastored back in Alabama, we had a man who was a military lawyer. Very bright man. A man who had been in the military for a good number of years. And he decided in his 40s that he would also like to be a paratrooper. But he had to earn his wings. And so he went to paratrooper school. And he successfully completed earning his wings, learning to be a paratrooper, a lawyer in the military, learning to paratroop into battle so that he could be on the front lines and serve in the JAG Corps on the front lines. He told us what it meant to earn your wings. The day of the ceremony came. And do you know how they pin the wings on for the men who have earned their wings as paratroopers? It's a little pin that has a clip kind of a thing that goes on the back of it. And normally when the paratrooper who has earned his wings puts it on, he takes his lapel and he punctures the lapel and he sticks a little clasp on the back of it. But on the day that they have their wings pinned, the commanding officer comes to the paratrooper, he takes the wings and he pounds them into their chest. Woe to the young man who doesn't earn his wings, but thinks he's a paratrooper. 
You do a novice no favors when you give him a fat head and puff him up and set him up for judgment by God. He begins to think that he is better than his comrades because he did not have to prove himself in spiritual battle first. He did not have to demonstrate wisdom first. He did not have to show a knowledge of the scriptures first and the scriptures of the sword of the spirit with which you fight off the enemy. He did not have to show that he knew how to wear the spiritual armor first, that he would be defended against the wiles of the devil. When the novice is placed in the position of honor, he begins to think that he's a natural. He's talented, he's bright, he's important, he's clever, he's desired. He's never had to stand down the enemy. He did not have to win any battles first. He didn't have to face another sword and get some scars. He did not have to come face to face with the vicious forces of spiritual darkness first. He was so important that he was able to skip all the training grades and jump to the top. That first warning was about the novice, pride, the condemnation of the devil. Just think of Satan. He had been the most perfect, the most beautiful, the most talented of all of the angelic beings. He was the most musical. He was the most powerful. He was the one who was closest to the throne of God. He walked among the stones of fire. But he began to look at himself. He began to take glory for himself instead of reflecting all the glory back to God. The second warning about having novices in ministry is the reproach of the devil. That's the Greek word onodismos. That's a word that means to revile, to rail at, to upbraid, to chide, to taunt because of disgrace or notoriety. That's a double-pronged war warning that's given to us here. First, it deals with the scornful character of the devil, who is a reviler and who rails against all that is holy. We see this described in Psalm 1, for example. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The scornful character of the devil, who is a reviler and who rails against that which is holy. Blessed is the man who has nothing to do with that. Proverbs 29.8, scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. Isaiah 28, 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. And God goes on to pronounce judgment against those of that character. You see, scorn is the reflection of the character of pride. We've been warned about the snare of the, or the uh, condemnation of the devil, and its reflection is in an attitude of scorn. That's a difficult character quality to deal with. Listen to what Proverbs says about it. Proverbs 9, 7, and 8. He that reproveth the scorner giveth to himself shame. He that rebuketh a wicked man giveth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Chapter 13, verse 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. He's someone who doesn't listen to correction. That's a problem with a novice who has a fat head. Proverbs 15, 12, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go to the wise. You see, pride keeps him from accepting correction. Proud and haughty scorner is his name. This is Proverbs 21, 24. Proud and haughty scorner is his name who dealeth in proud wrath. Scorn is tied to pride, but it's also 
tied to the angry spirit. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, and get a snare. Aha, interesting. And get a snare unto thy soul. We'll talk about the snare of the devil in a moment. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou get a snare unto thy lest thou learn his ways and get a snare unto thy soul. Proverbs twenty four nine. The thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. We're going to talk about that last phrase in just a moment. But Proverbs tells us that the only way to deal with a scorner is to get rid of him. Proverbs 22.10, cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. That very interesting word, onidismos, to revile, to rail at, to upbraid, to chide, to scorn, to taunt because of disgrace or notoriety. Another English word that deals with that problem is the word railing. Please remember that. Your mother may have used a phrase at some time in your life. Oh, he was ranting and railing. It's the idea of carrying loudly, waving the arms, screaming and yelling. That's a very dangerous thing for a believer to be doing. It brings him into the reproach of the devil. Peter explains it in 1 Peter 3, 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. 2 Peter 2, 11, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them, before the Lord. A specific instance of that in Jude, verse 9, only one chapter in Jude, of course. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Michael is an archangel. But he would not use a railing accusation. The second thing is it deals what, with what will happen to the believer. First, it dealt with the scornful character of the devil. Now, it deals with what will happen to the believer that falls into the reproach of the devil. He will be disgraced and scorned by others. He makes himself a persona non gratia. He will be defamed, taunted, and disgraced. He loses his testimony and his impact for Christ with unbelievers. We see illustrations of this word being used both negatively and positively. For example, it is a good thing when our reproach is for the sake of Christ. For example, Luke 6.22 Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, there's our word, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Paul tells us this in 1 Timothy 4.9. He says, For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, there's our word, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Sometimes the reproach is brought on us because we have been attacked by Satan. Paul explains that in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Interesting. To keep Paul from pride, God allowed Satan to attack him and allowed Satan to beat up on him, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Remember, this is the context of spiritual warfare going on here, folks. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Now listen, he's going to use this in a positive way here. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And we see a good use of that illustration in Hebrews chapter 11, or of that word, where it says Moses was willing to bear the reproach of Christ rather than get all the treasures of Egypt. So how do we understand that when we talk about the reproach of the devil? Reproach is bad when it is the reproach of the devil, that is, being reproached for reflecting the character of Satan, but not the reproach of Christ, which is being reproached for reflecting the character of Christ. You see, a novice who is put into a position of honor or authority will soon begin to reflect the character of Satan. That's the reproach of the devil. But Paul speaks here, in the passages that I've just read, of the reproach of Christ. And that is what we should be bearing. It may come during an attack by Satan, but it is not because we have the character of Satan that is being reflected in our lives. The third warning that's given to us in that passage there in 1 Timothy is concerning the snare of the devil. An interesting word, Paul uses it several times in 1 Timothy. It's the word pogis. That's a specific kind of trap that has a deadly noose attached to it. It's a trap that when the noose is sprung, either it strangles you, and there are many cultures in the world whereby they will set a pogis, a, a trap of this type, where when a small animal, for example, runs into it, it grabs the neck of the animal, jerks it off the ground, and strangles it to death. Or in other cultures where there is a trap, where there is a noose, and it catches the foot of the animal, or of the man, and jerks him off the ground, where he is hanging upside down and helpless. That's the word that is used here, the snare of the devil. The devil would love to catch you in his noose. He would love to strangle you if he could. Where you have no voice for Christ and where you die in shame. Or jerk your foot off the ground where you cannot move forward in battle and you become helpless as the enemy comes and thrusts you through. Just like Absalom riding his mule under the branches of a tree was caught by the head in the fork of the branches and Joab and the men of his company came and ran him through with javelins. Be very careful of this snare of the devil. Paul explains that one to us too in 1 Timothy. He tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and remember, that's the same book where he's warning about novices falling into the snare of the devil. He uses it both in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. First, in that same book, he uses the same word in 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, a pogis, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. They that will be rich. That's their goal in life. Although well, they may have many excuses for it, many reasons for making that their goal. But he says, be careful. They that will be rich fall into temptation. There is a temptation. One of the richest men in the world before he died, someone asked him, well, you already have several billion dollars. How much more do you want? And he thought for a moment and he said, just a little bit more. He died surrounded by Mormon keepers, eating nothing but ice cream and babbling like he was an old man. 
they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That is one of the snares that Satan sets and is the specific snare that is mentioned for us here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 26 he mentions the snare again. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. He warned Timothy about the snare of the devil in 1 Timothy. He reiterates it in 2 Timothy, the very last epistle that Paul wrote. That should tell us this is a rather important and deadly snare that Satan sets, especially for the novice, but it will also affect those who are no longer novices when they take their eyes off eternal riches and place their eyes on temporal riches. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, just a few verses before that one where it talked about those that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Just four verses earlier, Paul says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. That's somebody who has the plague. They have a spiritual disease that you do not want to catch. From such, withdraw thyself. We think of this be separate, which is up on the board behind me here, usually in the context of ecclesiastical separation. But Paul says there's another kind of separation, and that is from believers whose goal and motive in life is to make the big bucks, because that's a disease that spreads like wildfire. There's a godly separation in our text tonight. The Holy Ghost says, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the ministry whereunto I have called them. There is the right kind of separation where the Holy Spirit does the separation. He separates us to ministry. But there's a separation that is necessary to avoid the danger of pollution by the thing that runs the world, which is money. Look at that in its full context here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, now notice the first thing he mentions. Remember we talked about the different three different problems that are related to the devil? What was the first one? He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words where have come envy, strife, railings. <laughs> Why, suddenly there we have reproaches, evil surmisings, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. There we have the third one. The snare of the devil, covetousness. See, Paul is carrying some themes through his first epistle to Timothy. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. What a different view than the world has. The snare of the devil is to make you think that there's something out there you've just got to have. That's what all advertising does. That is the goal of advertising, to make you discontent with what you have. To make you discontent with the state in which God has put you. You've got to have more. 
You've got to have more. You've got to have this. You've got to have better. You have to have all these things of earth. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. He didn't even mention housing, did he? With food and raiment, let us be there with content. And then our verse. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a pogis, a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. You become a fool. You come under reproach and disdain because you have fallen into the snare of the devil. And it hurts. It's a hurtful lust which drown men, that's death, in destruction and perdition. Apogis doesn't just jerk your foot off the ground, sometimes it gets your neck. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith. Look at that. The first thing he tells you about covetousness is it affects your theology. You've heard those get-rich-quick schemes. You've heard the health and wealth and prosperity gospel preachers. I read an interesting article recently about one of these very famous on Trinity Broadcasting Network preachers who was raising money for some poor people in Africa. <laughs> Turned out that when they investigated it, he wasn't helping refugees escape persecution. He was taking the money and using it in that country for his gold and diamond mining operations. Yes, he owned gold and diamond mines, and he'd cut a deal with the government to keep it hushed up, pretending that he was helping refugees escape persecution. Yeah, fall into foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. What are you supposed to do instead? Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after. And we talked about following after when we were talking about the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Goodness and mercy shall follow him all the days of his life. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Oh, are you focused on that? Or are you following money? Are you following righteousness? Are you following godliness? Are you following faith? Are you following love? Are you following patience? Are you following meekness? And here we get back to spiritual warfare. Paul hasn't changed his subject. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are going to be fighting a fight of faith for the rest of your life. And you are to keep fighting until Christ returns. And one of the traps that you have to watch for is the snare of the devil. If you don't pay attention, not merely novices, but those who have walked in the faith a long time can be caught in that snare. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Remember, that's the God before whom you're going to stand. But he hasn't changed his subject. Look at the very next verse. Verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. 
there are some wealthy Christians. And God does entrust to some people wealth. Oh, but it is a dangerous trust. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. What is high-minded? Takes us back to that first warning about the devil. The condemnation of the devil was what? Pride. The ones that are rich in this world, charge them that they be not high-minded that they don't start thinking of themselves better than everybody else, that they don't think of themselves as proud, that they're the smart ones, they're the ones that got it all together, they're the ones that put together that big bank account, they're the ones that are sitting on it, hoping it will hatch. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. You see, suddenly they change the focus of their faith. but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. How are we to enjoy them? He tells you in the next verse that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, and that's the word that means to share. Because you see, the stuff that you have down here doesn't last forever. But here's what you can do with it laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. You see, he had just warned about they have erred concerning the faith because of their money, their focus. Grace be with thee, amen. The first to Timothy was written from Laodicea, which is the chiefest city of Phrygia, Pacatiana. Well, we've used more time on that than I had anticipated. Let me get back to the text here. But that is the context. They've got a young man who was not called by the Holy Spirit to go on this ministry. He's a novice. Somewhere along the line, we're not told exactly what the specific issue was. But he leaves them after he's had a confrontation with the devil. And that's why Paul doesn't want to take him on the next missionary journey. And that's what breaks up perhaps the greatest missionary team that ever existed in the history of the church. Now God sovereignly used that. He sent out then two teams. But a young man who was a novice put into a position of leadership. A young man who somehow, after a confrontation with the devil, wasn't ready for that spiritual warfare. The temptation of the devil. The reproach of the devil. The snare of the devil. God in his mercy graciously chose not to tell us which one hit that young man. But he fled the scene. He left the battle. He went AWOL. Back to the text. Sent by the Holy Ghost, but also we find they were sent by wise, prayerful men. They were sent by the church. There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, these were people who wanted the will of God and they wanted to see the gospel spread. They ministered to the Lord, that is, they were serving. They were fasting. When was the last time you fasted? Because you wanted to know the will of God. Have you ever fasted? Folks, this is not Old Testament. This is New Testament. This is squarely in the midst of the church age. This is on the beginning of the very first 
what we call missionary journey. These were men who wanted to know the will of God. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, How badly do you want to know the will of God? The Holy Ghost separates people. Separate me, that is, separate for me and my service. Somebody out there, that's not what he said. Grab anybody off the street and say, hey, we're going to send you and give you money every month. Why, we're going to give you 5,000 bucks a month. You know, it's interesting to me that oftentimes when I get missionary letters, and I've been getting missionary letters for 50 years or more, they'll tell you we need a certain percentage. We're down a certain percentage. Some of them will tell you we're down a certain number of dollars per month. They almost never tell you what their full amount is that they're supposed to receive on the field. Because oftentimes it is a shocking figure. And yes, I know it costs money to travel to and from those countries. And it costs money to get all the stuff over there that they need, the vehicles and all the equipment and all the other stuff. Though we don't find anywhere in the New Testament carrying lots of stuff to the fields. And yes, there is a need to support their families, but most undeveloped countries of the world, the cost of living is a great deal less than in the United States. But you never hear the amount set by the mission boards that is supposed to be 100% fully supported, plus the funds that are set aside for travel. Yes, I know that someday they're going to have to retire, too. They would like to have some money set aside for retirement. Very few Bible-preaching churches in the United States tend even to give that to their pastors. Hmm. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. Not for the vacation, not for the having a fun time, but for the work whereunto I have called them. And you know, it's interesting because now we find something else. They've ministered and fasted, but now it says, after the Holy Spirit says that, when they had fasted and prayed, they were going to have a confirmation of this. They fasted and prayed, and then they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. The church sent them after there was confirmation that the Holy Ghost had called them. And it is at that point that it says the Holy Ghost sends them. Verse 4, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. In the preceding verse it said that these elders in the church, these men who are leaders in the church, prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. But what they're really being sent by was the Holy Spirit, verse 4. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, here was their purpose. First place that they stopped and did this, they were getting clear direction from God. Their purpose, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, there's much more that we could say about that, but our time is up for tonight. Let's close in prayer. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. There are so many things here in this text that as we examine it and begin to see what you have put there, you've packaged it tightly with a great deal. Places that were passed by, Paul and Barnabas merely stopped there as a port of call until they reached one specific place. Why so? Father, you call to specific opportunities. You call by your spirit and not merely a matter of human emotions. You qualify, you separate, you send, and you cause a recognition by the church of that sending so that a laying on of hands, we would call it ordination, takes place for the specific ministry. And it is a ministry which will involve spiritual warfare. For all of us, at some point, are involved in that warfare. Make us well-trained, make us articulate, make us men and women who know the word of God, men and women who do not fall into the condemnation of the devil, men and women who do not fall into the reproach of the devil, men and women who do not fall into the snare of the devil. Those who are in the center of your will doing what you have called us to do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.